All right, everybody, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night, nine o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, um, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, but mainly how to grow it, and often the weird and interesting fruits that you guys have never heard of, or probably have never heard of. Uh, in today's episode, we actually are going to be talking about a number of fruits that are not very common, that are, are not sold in stores. And if you want to actually be able to eat them, you have to grow them yourself. Um, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about some fruits that are ripening now in the spring. And we're going to give them a, a little bit of a breakdown, talk about what I really like to eat right now what my favorites are, uh, what I don't necessarily like. And then we're also going to be talking about figs quite briefly in terms of their, their uh, hormonal imbalance. And that'll finish up the episode. Uh, if you guys have any questions that you guys would like to have me answer on the next episode, we're going to try to do that at the end of every episode of Fruit Talk. So send me an email um, or send me a message through one of my social media accounts and I'll make sure that I bring it up or you can comment um, the question on my YouTube videos would actually be the best way to go about doing that and then uh, on the latest video I will get back to you guys if you know this is for the podcast or this question is for the podcast um, and you comment on the YouTube video, I will, uh, I'll get back to you guys in the, in the next episode of Fruit Talk. So on to some of the fruits that are ripening right now. And, uh, I find to be quite good. It seems like a lot of fruits, um, it takes quite a bit of time for some of these perennials to really get going once they do. It's amazing around this time of the year, how much actually is ripening. Um, before that, you know, before I would say early June in this area, in the Philadelphia area, it's kind of difficult and it's really a long drought of, uh, of fruit. So the first thing that always ripens here is the strawberry. And some people say that it's the honeyberry, but it's not the honeyberry. Those people are sort of liars because, um, the honeyberry may turn blue before the strawberry turns red, but the honeyberry needs two weeks after it turns blue before you should eat it and pick them. So uh, the strawberry is actually ripe. I sh you should say technically ripe before the honeyberries. Um, so the, the strawberries come in and the strawberries are out of this world. We are trying to put together a little taste test, little series. I've been struggling to kind of get my thoughts together and also get them ripe at the same time. Uh, I've been having a number of uh, different, you know, critters around the yard that are getting to the strawberries and I've been just haven't had enough time to really uh, tie the nets down. I put the, the bird netting over top of the strawberry patches and that works out real well. It's just, you have to staple the nets down to the ground with some garden staples and I just, haven't gotten a chance to do that. So they're getting underneath and they're, uh, they're making a little bit of a mess, but you know, it is what it is. I'm, I'm sort of sharing with the wildlife and I don't mind necessarily doing that to an extent. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is, but I have learned and we did do a little bit of a taste test about the newer strawberries that were growing like Rucker's Scarlet and uh, the Purple Wonder Strawberry from Cornell and also the uh, Early Glow which has been a standard for us as a June bear for a long time. I think it's definitive at this point that Rucker's Scarlet is a keeper and it's going to replace Early Glow um, as my June bearing type and the Purple Wonder it seems like to me is just not all that great. I'm not going to rip them out. We're going to give them one more year. Plus, I still have some more fruits that are going to ripen. But 
as it stands right now i just don't see a lot of potential in the purple wonder strawberry it's kind of uh really disappointing unfortunately and it's not even really getting purple it's like uh it really is like a re it's like a the same color as my mar de bois or really any other red strawberry it's not getting purple so i wonder even if it is legit maybe it's mislabeled i should call burpee those uh those guys you know they charge 14 dollars for one purple wonder strawberry plant and if that one purple wonder strawberry plant is mislabeled that's really disappointing because first off it's really a ridiculous amount of money to charge for one plant and i get it because there's patents and people spend a lot of money to breed these things but you know that really is like you got to be crazy you got really do you got to be crazy to buy something like that because you can get 25 strawberry plants of mar de bois for the same price and mar de bois is incredible uh this also the season has also really solidified my thoughts on the mar de bois because i do actually have plenty of strawberries that i've been harvesting off the mar de bois they are an ever-bearing type however they just do not stop producing and they put out a big crop like the june bearers do so there's really no reason to even have a june bearing type i just think it's nice to have more strawberries that ripen in june when there's not a whole lot of fruit also when i really like strawberries and i don't mind picking a lot of fruit whereas if i had more of the mar de bois that ripen continuously from you know sometime in july all the way till frost it's just a lot of work i get tired of it i don't want to have to be picking so many strawberries every day um during those times of the year during that time of the year so um in order to get more strawberries <laughs> you have to kind of add a june bearing type and have less of the mar de bois although if you were to have only one strawberry it would be the mar de bois it's so incredible and we made some jam that was specifically mar de bois and in fact i made five jars now of mar de bois jam and i have a really incredible recipe that you guys ought to write down i should put it up on my uh my instagram my facebook it's so good where what I'm doing is that I'm actually adding into the jam quite a bit of Welch's grape juice, believe it or not. And this is giving it a little bit of that Concord grape flavor that, believe it or not, the Mar de Bois strawberry sort of already has. It's not in your face, though. And I thought maybe if I add some grape juice, it would really intensify that flavor. And it did. It's so, so good. This jam, I've been eating it nonstop. I already ate a whole jar in really only like two or three days. <laughs> the amount of strawberries that I have eaten in the last week, two weeks, has been ridiculous. You would you would look at me and think, wow, what what is wrong with you? But uh, I promise you, they're really, really good. Um, and the jam is incredible. So not only do I add the, the grape juice, I add lemon juice. I add um, really not a whole lot of sugar. They already are. The strawberry is really high in bricks. It's a really high, high aromatic strawberry. Um, it's just incredible. Uh, I did do a little bit of vanilla on one batch, and it really didn't come through at all. So I just said forget about it. Um, plus I don't think it really needs any vanilla. Um, but with the grape juice and the lemon, you're good. And in fact, you don't even need to add any pectin. It, it really cooks down even with the juice and forms a pretty good texture, uh, to the jam. And I could have even went further than I did. What is impressive actually is the color. That's the most impressive thing of the jam. This is just a photo here. But I'll tell you, it doesn't really do it justice. It really is like a dark red jam. And almost like what you would see out of the picture of a purple wonder strawberry <laughs> is that it actually is almost purple. 
Um, so really incredible, I have to say. Uh, it's it's like maroon color. Let's say that it's like maroon, and you know I even added some blueberries into this first batch. Really unnecessary, uh, but it did add maybe a little bit of extra something. And I'll tell you that this jam is probably the best jam I've ever made. Um, it does come close to fig jam. Fig jam is, it's really hard to beat. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. Um, blueberry jam is also really incredible. If you can get that right, is just phenomenal. Um, those three seem to be my favorite. Now, what else you can do in terms of jam is actually make some current jam. And I have red currants coming in right now uh, to a crazy degree. The red currants always produce insane amounts of fruit very easily, very reliable, uh, just like the strawberry. However, the red currant isn't really all that good when eating fresh. You got to process it. And I looked up different ways you could process these things and... You know, I'm not really all that into processing myself uh, with some of these fruits. I will say I did try with the strawberries. I tried some strawberry bars. It's so many strawberries that I just decided let's make some bars out of them. You get like some flour, some brown sugar, and some uh, oatmeal and uh you know, a little bit of cornstarch and a little bit of salt. And, you know, basically you turn it into like a baked good with strawberries in it. Kind of like what you would make. You'd kind of make like a, a Nutri-Grain bar, but not, you know, like a strawberry Nutri-Grain bar. And it really wasn't, it wasn't that great. Um, so a bit disappointing, you know, uh, I'm kind of running out of things and ways. I guess you could. I could have made a pie with the strawberries. Probably the second best option. Uh, a liqueur or maybe a syrup would also be a great option. My issue here is that I don't think liqueurs are probably all that. They're not all that interesting to me. I think a wine would be an interesting thing to do. And I thought doing this with the red currants, making a wine, would be fantastic. I did watch a video. A couple of videos of people making wine at home, and I just really was not into the whole process. Um, it doesn't seem like my thing, but at some point I am going to make my own wine, and maybe I should just suck it up and do it. And that would be, I think, the best scenario with the red currants. However, there is some pretty good, solid information out there, and it's like a delicacy apparently that red currant jam is like the best what you have to do and i made red currant jam i've done it but i didn't do it right i did i did add a little bit too much sugar to it that was a big mistake also the berries themselves i didn't ripen all of them to like per perfection you can tell right in here this was kind of a mix of what i used in the jam instead of waiting for them all to turn red like this or most of them like this uh, I think this is mainly what I was dealing with here. So it's a pretty good mix and I harvested these rather quickly because of the birds. The birds love all these fruits by the way. Early in the spring you have to protect all this stuff. Doesn't matter what it is. You just ain't gonna get anything if you don't protect it. So um, a lot of this though I was eating fresh and I will eat red currants fresh. There are once they hang on the bush and they they really are red for an extended period of time, maybe like a, you know four to five days of them being red, they do lose a lot of the astringency. They do lose uh, well, almost all the astringency. They do lose almost somewhat what you would think of is the tartness of it because it does become a lot sweeter. And that becomes the main, you know, the main flavor, I should say. And, you know, if you do that, I think you actually will have a better jam because without a doubt, you to get the best jam, you have to have the best fruit. If you start out right, just like with wine, you got to have the best grapes 
if you start out right, you're going to have the best product at the end of it. So for me, I, uh, I messed up. Also, the third thing that they do with this delicacy is that they they strain out all the seeds because the the red currants uh, have a lot of seeds within them, um, and also I think they may even do the skin if there's any a little bit of skin in there. Um, it's then turns into a really a smoother product, and believe it or not, if you don't do that with the red currants you really will regret it there are some things like figs which i really don't mind having all the seeds in there um i actually like that i prefer that um i do like a little bit of chunks of fruit in my jam but the red currant is just one of them things that you you it's just not pleasurable to eat with all those seeds it just ruins sort of ruins the experience so what i'm going to do is I'm going to give it a real fair shot. Uh, I'm going to get them perfectly ripe. I'm going to add very minimal sugar. We're going to taste it. We could add more sugar as we go. We can add other things as we go. And then I'm going to strain it and get all the seeds out, get all the skins out, really make it smooth. And then we'll make a decision... <laughs> as to what the deal is because to in all honesty um i don't really see a place for the red current in my yard as it stands right now it does give me uh, a good amount of fruit i you know I, you get tired of eating strawberries right so i go over to the red the red currants which are realistically they are probably right there right afterwards along with the honeyberry we'll get to the honeyberry in a second but the red currant, you know, is a nice little change of pace. Not the first thing I go for. Never will be the first thing I go for. But it is it is nice to have, but I could live without it. I really could. I could take out my red currant bushes and put something else there. I really could. So if uh, if it's not working out, it's not working out. And, you know, that's just something I'll have to do. But we'll see how the jam comes. What I am going to do, I think as well, is try a syrup. We're going to try a red currant syrup. Um, I used to add the currants to my kombucha. That's actually a really great idea. Comes out great. I don't make my own kombucha anymore, so there's that issue. I guess I could sell the, the fruits to somebody um, if, it, if it really wanted to come to that. Uh, but you know, overall, um, it is what it is. I, I don't know. We'll have to experiment and see what the deal is. Maybe we can come up with some sort of solution. But like I said, out of all the spring fruits, it's one of my least favorites. Um, now, something that is still really been on my mind and uh, it's just taken a while for it to really come into fruition is the honeyberry. Um, I've been moving them around a lot. Some of them are getting sort of damaged and just where they're at. And it's just the whole thing, really, the whole trial of them has really not been ideal. And to be fair, I've never really given them a fair shot. So to either say that they're great or to say that they're bad is just would be wrong. However, I do see a lot of potential in them. Um, the birds love them. And by the time I get the nets on them, a lot of the crop is already sort of gone. Um, because they are the first thing to turn color. Although they're not ripe for two weeks, I really wait too long to get the nets on. Also, they're really not all that productive just yet. They're still very young, even though I've had some of them now for like, this is their fourth year. It doesn't seem to matter. They're really uh, quite unproductive plants at younger ages. And it's a shame. It is a shame. But... You know, at some point we'll do a proper trial, I think, of those berries and give them a fair shot. And we can see, and you know, I would really like to actually have um, a row of really the sweeter varieties of honeyberries, like the Boreal series that we talk about quite often. Um, but as it stands right now, you know, not too keen on them. I do know that they make a really great jam. And that could be something that 
maybe would knock some other things down a peg in terms of their priority for jam. Like, uh, you know, the strawberries, I guess you could make a, make a bunch of strawberry jam, a bunch of currant jam, a bunch of honeyberry jam. I guess you could, I guess, have enough jam for your entire year, but I was not really eating a whole lot of jam. <laughs> up until this point so maybe it would be nice to you know really have jam for the the entire year although i find that in the winter time i just don't really crave as many of these fresh foods as i do in the uh in the summer and in the spring and in the fall you know uh my body just i think operates a little bit differently in the winter time because none of this is really available to me for the most part that I just sort of, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it exactly, but I'll tell you that, uh, I, I just miss a lot of, <laughs> I miss the growing season a lot in the winter time. And I think it has some sort of effect on me, but you know, those are the, the three main ones that ripen, um, quite early. And then there's a fourth one that I want to talk to you guys about. And then I think that's sort of it for the very, very early fruits for now. Um, I would have probably in a more normal year, mulberries. I would have in a more normal year, apricots and cherries. Um, the three of those did not really work out or I just don't have them right now. We did graft our Girardi mulberries or Girardi scion wood to all to all the seedlings that I had in the yard. Actually, I had three different seedlings that we grafted to. Two out of the three took, so we will have Girardi trees producing in the future. The apricots this year got hit with the frost. Also, not really all that productive anyway. The cherries really weren't all that productive, but they did actually get hit with uh, the squirrels, the birds, well before they were even close to ripe. And I didn't even notice right away, and uh, I lost all the cherries this year. Um, the bush cherries are also really not producing much of anything this year either. And I think it either was a pollination issue or it really was the frost that hit them hard. So I don't know what to do. Um, maybe it's age related. I don't know. But uh, some of the things that we normally would have just aren't happening this year um quite strange i have to say and i wonder if there is a there is a pollination issue with the bush cherries which if there is that really is not good and i need to solve that right away it's just i don't i can't really tell um i'll have to i'll have to really dig around and see if i can find some information because it, it there was a ton of flowers i should have had a ton of fruit after the frost, it didn't seem like the flowers really died or got hurt in any fo any fashion. I just really didn't get much fruit set, uh, and they all ended up falling off. Whatever did set ended up falling off. So really quite strange. Don't know. Uh, anyway, I don't. We used to have, by the way, a third bush cherry because we have Romeo and Juliet. We had Carmine Jewel. I got rid of the Carmine Jewel because it really was bad and uh, I don't remember where that was last year so maybe that was somehow giving the right pollination to the other two I don't know um, who knows anyway so the uh, yeah so that those are those three fruits that we probably would have around this time and pretty shortly um, in the next couple weeks if we don't already have them you then would see things like the gooseberry and the black currant, and we could talk about those soon. I also have the uh, the first crop of raspberries coming up, and I also have blueberries coming up. So we can kind of put all those together, I think, in a, another episode of Fruit Talk when those actually do come in, because uh, that'll be interesting to talk about those. However, there is one fruit that is shockingly very very good also really early uh, quite reliable puts out a lot of fruit and even puts out some decently sized fruit 
and it's become one of my favorite fruits. And we are going to do a number of videos on the YouTube channel about it. I've been trying to learn as much as I can about it and uh, really focus on getting more plants. I'm going to be air layering and seeing if that process works. We tried rooting some cuttings, but just by sticking them in the ground, that did not seem to work. Uh, so I may have to air layer them with uh, some rooting hormone or I may have to root them. I don't know how you propagate these things. I'm going to be honest with you. I can't figure it out. Um, I wonder if they're propagated from seed. Um, but I don't know if I really would get the same fruit size that I'm getting on this particular variety because this particular variety is so large. That's what's so impressive about it. And it's actually, I don't think I've mentioned the name of the fruit in the last two minutes, <laughs> but it's the Gumi. It is the Gumi. And the Gumi is, like I said, quite early. Uh, it is ripening right now. And I've been getting my first couple fruits in the last few days. You know, June 8th, June 7th, I think I got my first couple this year. It is impressive. It's an impressive fruit. I really, really enjoy eating it. It's a pleasure to eat it. It's not something that, you know, you can just mindlessly eat it. I feel like it's one of those things you can really enjoy eating it. Like, uh, almost like the way, you know, you ever eat like a Reese's cup and, and you eat the outside of the Reese's cup first and then you eat the inside. Or maybe you guys can think of some food that you can eat and you eat it a very specific way. Uh, I find that sort of it's like that with the with the gumi is that it's sort of it's like an exper it's like an experience. Pistachios maybe you could say. Pistachios you got to deshell them. It's like a lot of work. Crabs it's a lot of work. Um, you know crab legs you got to do all this breaking and. You know, then when you finally eat it, it's like an, it's just more, it seems more rewarding for whatever reason. Not that there's a lot of work <laughs> involved with the Gumi. There's only a pit in the middle, which comes out very easily, by the way. Um, however, I find that it's just an experience. Something about it to me just gives me an experience, an eating experience. I don't know. Uh, so anyway, it, it uh, it's really like I said, become one of my favorites. It uh, it's named Gumi because it's supposed to be resemble a uh, a gummy bear, and that's why they've named it that. And I thought, yeah, that's crazy. There's no way this fruit doesn't resemble a gummy bear. It does, guys. It does. I promise you. It's the absolute truth. I couldn't believe it. I still don't believe it. Um, I've already seen some of them now, which are of that gummy bear state that they get in. So what what happens is they turn from uh, you know this light bronze color um, to then a little bit greenish, and then they start getting a little bit orange and red and flamingo I guess and then they finally turn red and then um, once they turn red then they start to dry up on the plant and it doesn't take very long and if you actually some birds love them so the birds peck a little bit you'll see this one right here they pecked into this one and it dries up very quickly that way um, it's filled with a lot of juice on the inside quite difficult to describe the fruit I have to say uh, you know the texture is a lot when it's not in that gummy bear dried state it's quite juicy and I don't know how to really compare it to anything else I really it's just such a weird fruit you know there isn't a whole lot of fiber in it there isn't a whole lot of uh, substance it's really like a balloon it feels like of juice but not to that extent I, I i don't know how to really put it so finally the inside dries up 
And then once the inside dries up, it's it is like a gummy bear. Uh, the flavor not necessarily like a gummy bear, but it is pretty close. The flavor surprisingly does remind me a lot of a red currant. Um, they're shockingly close, so it's it's quite tart. It does have a lot of astringency. It it never seems to really totally fully lose that astringency, which is I actually really like that. It kind of like gives me that feeling on your tongue when you're done eating it like a great really nice glass of wine that you know has that you know it has that feeling in your mouth when you swish it around that lingering flavor on your palate but also that lingering feeling on your palate um when you swish wine around you know let me take a sip here You know, you swish that around, get the air into it. Really gives you all that, I guess, that tannin, right? All that almost like astringency in a way. Um, on your, your tongue, your mouth, your, it coats your entire mouth with it. And that lasts for a decently long time. And that's a big reason why I like that fruit so much. I also find the Mar de Bois does that too. The Mar de Bois has a really nice lingering flavor, um, but not really giving you that feeling that that wine does. I actually think the Gumi gives you that feeling um, pretty darn well. And I, I don't know what I would... I like eating them so much. I wonder what you could do with them. You know, maybe they would be like super amazing at one particular thing. Like maybe they would make a great wine. I don't know because if they got all that that tannin in there and that astringency, maybe they would make a good wine. I don't know exactly. I'd have to really think about it when I'm eating these things because they're really ripening now. Like a lot of them are turning color. Um, not a lot of them are dried just yet. So we're not at that gummy bear state. It doesn't take very long after they turn red, maybe three days. Um, so what I need to do is actually, I'm gonna make a video quite soon talking about the different stages of the fruit, really breaking that down, I think. Um, but you know, I think as I'm eating them, I really am gonna just kind of brainstorm and think really hard about what it is I think this fruit could uh, could have a better potential with than instead of just eating them fresh. However, like I said, this this fruit's probably my top five for fresh eating. Um, probably would put in there the persimmon, the fig, the mar de bois, the gumi, the apricot. Man, you get, I mean, there's a lot of them in there, to be honest with you. It's tough to really just limit that to five. Because I do, in terms of the fruits I grow, I should say, uh, I do really enjoy uh, grapes. Especially if you can really let them hang for a long time, you don't have any disease. Um, that's the best. Um, I really like the Asian pear as well. Um, So yeah, there's a number of fruits, but you know, at least in the top seven, let's just say that. Let's just put let's put them in the top seven. I, I could make an argument that they're really high up there. I think um, so. Definitely one of my favorites, um, and just really not talked about enough. So that's why we're gonna try to give a lot of attention and light to this particular fruit. Just like the persimmon this year, we are trying to talk about them as much as we can. And uh, that's my goal, to try to move away, even the pomegranate too, uh, try to move away from figs a little bit and move into those fruits and put a lot of time and energy um, talking about them and learning about them. I'd also probably put the mulberry maybe in that, that high up list. Who knows? Anyway, um, yeah, so I think it's really quite interesting the fruit like i said it's got some tartness to it not as much not nearly as much as the red currant 
and I guess that's really what separates it is that it's a less tart, much sweeter version of the red currant with a little bit of astringency, with a different texture, no seed. I mean, you spit out the pit. Um, it's it's an overall it's a better uh, eating experience for a number of reasons. So, and they're ripping at the same time, which is another reason why it's kind of just like making red currants a little bit redundant for me. Um, yeah, so I think that's a pretty decent way to describe the fruit. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk to you guys about, because we're going to go into those other spring fruits that are going to ripen. At the last part of the spring, they come in before the summer hits, or even really the beginning of the summer. We'll talk about those in another episode of Fruit Talk. But what I do want to mention in this particular episode is actually figs. We want to talk about these for just a minute. And what I've been doing with the fig trees, as most of you guys know, is that we cut them down that are in the ground. We prune them all the way down to 6 to 12 inches. By doing that, you increase the chances that your tree will be in a hormonal imbalance the following year. One of the most, one of the, the biggest factors into a tree or a plant's hormonal balance is pruning. Whether that's summer pruning or winter pruning, it really has a big effect on the tree. And there is something called auxin that is formed or produced at the tips of the, the plants, which then goes down the branches, down the trunk, and it goes all the way to the ends of the roots, where at the ends of the roots, actually another hormone is produced called the cytokinins. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And the that hormone counteracts the auxin, and they kind of fight each other for dominance and the auxin uh, because the the cytokines let's just say they go up from the root ends and they try to go all the way up to the top of the tree where the auxin is produced so they're kind of like fighting each other and you know one of them suppresses the lower growth so the auxin at the top is controlling that dominance and creating an environment where it's stopping a lot of the tree from putting out all these side shoots, these lateral buds from forming. It's stopping that from even occurring. Particularly in the fig, that is a very dominant hormone. Now the cytokinins, once the auxin, let's say, is free, if you do some summer pruning, and you prune off the tips or even a little bit on the branches, what you end up having is a lot of the cytokinins taking over and then they actually act in a way to have the tree or the plant branch out. So, you know, that's just a little bit of a brief introduction, I think, into the the main plant hormones within plants. Um, There's more, obviously, but you know, those two, it seems like really control the fruiting of the fig tree. And with just like us as humans, if we're not really in the right hormonal balance, it's really not a good thing. Um, in fact, it has such a big effect on our lives, more so than minerals and vitamins and let's say fertilizer or water. Um that your hormones are like a big, big deal. So if you can really control these hormones correctly by having the proper pruning, the tree and the plant really does this on its own. You don't really have to intervene all that much. However, with the way that I grow my figs, it's really at it's really difficult to keep my trees in hormonal balance. And it seems like that certain varieties for sure uh, without a doubt, deal with hard pruning a lot better than other varieties. For example, I could really prune my Azores Dark, Iraqi, that Palmata Hybrid. I could do Golden Rainbow. Uh, LSU Huye seems to do really well with it. Um, 
LSU Tiger seems to do really well with it. Some hardy Chicago types seem to do pretty well with it. Uh, Taramo Unknown seems to do pretty well with it. And you could pretty much prune them down to like nothing. And, the, and they'll still fruit for you that year. Whereas other trees, other varieties of figs like um, Black Mission and uh, you know Galicia Negra and some of the Adriatic type figs. Um, what are some other ones? Probably Panache uh, is one of them. Uh, raspberry Latte. Uh, man, there's a lot of them. Pew Fine. Sweet Joy. Uh, there's a huge number of them. Um, actually, probably there's more of those than there are of the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so a lot of figs, just in general, they don't really like to be pruned all that much. And it's a big recommendation. If you're trying to get them to fruit well every year, you don't want to do a lot of pruning. In fact, you really don't want to take off more than four inches of growth. Um, so it's just it's a it, the way that I'm growing them is really quite interesting and sort of an experiment and you know you can sort of imagine a scenario and where cutting them down to 6 to 12 inches would make sense because if you had actually trained them as Japanese espaliers and you keep cutting them back you would imagine that it's got to work right because if you have Japanese espaliers that work why can't sort of the the spur pruning style that I'm doing why can't that work um, but I have had mixed results this year I think it's age related um, it's variety related it's climate related there's a lot of thought that I'm putting into into these hormones and how this is all really playing a, a, a part in the overall production of my figs and it really is a big deal and it's something I really need to figure out because there really isn't the there in, the answer really doesn't exist. I mean, I may never really find the answer, uh, but I think I've sort of come up with a decent solution here in terms of girdling. And I found this study here that was really quite interesting that I want to share it with you guys. Um, I think maybe there is a couple people that exist in the world that know enough about figs like ponds but probably maybe be the only guy that could give me a great answer on this particular thing um you know i have never emailed the guy i do have his email and maybe i should bug him on this particular thing because it is such a big deal it is um so what i'm thinking here at least for now is that i could try girdling and in this study, you'll notice it's not really the best study, I think, in terms of the just the straight up amount of data points that they have. Uh, also, it would be better if they had some photos exactly showing me how to girdle these trees. Um, it is a little bit confusing here, uh, even though these photos are sort of, you know, depicting that. And they do describe here in this in the study uh, exactly what the what the girdle should look like, but it really doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm gonna have to reread through this and really figure out exactly the way that they're girdling the trees, and the way that I'm gonna girdle my trees is a bit different than they're gonna do it. And I'm gonna try it multiple different ways and see what really works and, and maybe it's too late. Maybe the, maybe I'm not going to get a whole lot of benefit out of this in terms of the whole goal is with the girdling is to shake the hormonal imbalance is to get the trees to just potentially get out of this weird hormone state because there's a thing called the phloem. I think that's how you pronounce it this word right here P H L O E M and if I do like a Wikipedia search here um, and just get a definition of the phloem um, you'll see that it says here that 
Uh, the phloem is the living tissue in vascular plants that transports the soluble organic compounds made during photosynthesis, um, which is like the sugars and carbohydrates that the, the plant creates. And it transplates, transports those carbohydrates to parts of the plants where it's needed. And it goes down into the roots. So it forms in the leaves, right? That's where the photosynthesis occurs for the most part. And then it goes down from the leaves into the branches, into the trunk, and then into the roots. And this, of course, provides the tree with nutrients that it needs desperately to survive. And if you were to actually very strongly um, girdle your tree, especially specific trees of specific ages, you could kill them. And it really is something you have to be very careful about doing. Um, but what this means is that if you were to take the phloem out by doing some girdling, you take the bark off, you can see it right here, and basically you take the cambium off you basically have removed the phloem, right? So if you uh, if you do that, then you're stopping the nutrients that the tree is then f creating through photosynthesis. You're stopping that nutrients from going down into the bottom of the plant, into the roots. And therefore, more energy is being stored into whatever is above the girdle. And because of that, this study here states that they think that's likely the reason why that the sugar content in those fruits once you girdle the, the tree the sugar content of those fruits increases the fruit size increases and the amount of fruit increases so you literally because you are now having more carbohydrates being directed towards those fruits Oh my God, it just seems like the coolest thing ever. And I'm tempted to try this on different trees, not just the trees that have hormonal imbalance, uh, but also on trees that uh, I want to get better fruit quality from. I think that'd be a really interesting experiment. Um, now, what else it does is that it actually will, the phloem, by the way, is also responsible for sending um, hormones. So that's where the, the hormones flow through the tree, is that instead of going, let's say, into the xylem, uh, where the water and nutrients flow throughout the tree, the hormones are actually on the outer part of the tree where the phloem is. So if you, let's say you remove the phloem, that's also a way of changing the hormones in the plant and therefore could create a situation, potentially, that is quite interesting for getting these trees to fruit and potentially shaking that hormonal imbalance. And um, it's gonna be very, I think a very worthwhile experiment to see if it does work. We did some of it last year. Didn't really have any conclusive results, although it did seem a bit promising and the techniques and the way that I did it was a bit different and I tried a couple different things and it seemed like uh, it actually did a little bit more harm than good on certain branches, on certain trees. So maybe potentially it's not a great idea um, for specific uh, situations, but uh, we'll see because it, it does, I think, and it, here's where the issue I think was last year and where it could be in the future is that normally when you girdle, you girdle branches that are already um, brown and lignified and have usually some size to them. I had last year been girdling some branches that were green and are just now forming their shoots 
and that seemed to do a lot of damage to those particular shoots. So what I would need to have is a base, kind of like a cordon or a Japanese espalier, or the spur system that I have with a number of shoots coming from the base that we cut to six to 12 inches every year. Along that wood that's six to 12 inches long, I need to girdle that wood. And that's the wood that will make this whole thing seem a bit more reasonable and actually potentially work. So if I girdle that, however, that sort of creates some permanent damage along the tree, which is not what I want. So there needs to be, I think, if this is going to work the way that I think it's going to work, I need to figure out some sort of scenario where if I girdle a particular branch, the following season I cut that branch out and cut below where I had girdled the tree. Then a, a new branch comes up that same season and replaces um, would basically replace where I had where I had cut the other branch out. So if you think about, I guess to kind of have a renewal process in a way to always have something that you can girdle is sort of what I'm getting at because I don't want to have to girdle the new growth because it seemed like when I girdled the new stuff it really was a bad idea and I'm going to try that we will try that um, but we'll see of course what the uh, what the results are with all of this different ways of going about it and I'm going to Put this study, I think, uh, in the description of the video. Um, we're going to talk a lot more, I think, about this study in a video that I'm going to talk about the, the girdling process when I actually do it and the whole sort of experiment that I'm going to be doing where we'll trial this process and see what the results are. I, at this point, there's not a whole lot to lose because we are at June 9th, and if fruits are not forming now, it's really not a good sign so we need to take some desperate measures I think to really try some things and see what we can uh, we can do for some of these trees and you never know it may work um, so yeah uh, that is the end of the episode here of fruit talk I want to thank everybody out there for for listening and getting to this point here please check out our blog figboss.com we are going to create a new post soon I've been um, actually writing up a couple things that we're going to release here on the blog quite soon. The website, I say it every every episode, every day, the website is beautiful. Um, it looks even more beautiful now on mobile. I had really changed the way that it is viewed on mobile and uh, I'm shocked. I'm overwhelmed. I can't believe it. Uh, the SEO is still on pause for now. It seems like there's just so much going on. What we've also done here, guys, is that we've created a um, an Amazon store, and we're going to get a little bit into this this Amazon store here um, in a video that we're going to do. But you can go to oh, well, actually, it doesn't have it here, unfortunately. But if I go to my studio, you guys will be able to see it. But I'll. I'll uh I'll mention that at some point, but you can go I think somewhere on Amazon. I have a storefront <laughs> somewhere on Amazon, and it it has all the tools that I recommend that you guys use and buy. Um, you, things that I legitimately use, and you guys can see all the things that I I buy on Amazon. Um, so that if you're ever looking for something or trying to figure out what it is that I'm using exactly, you can go there and get it. And it, it does help me out, but in a very, very small way. So it's not like something that is really a big deal for me and sort of why I never set this up when I first started. But yeah, um, it is now available. We're going to do a video, I think, on the tools that I'm using and we did a video actually that's going to come out soon on row covers and we did a promotional video with, with that. Um, and the last thing I guess I want to say, if you guys really enjoyed this, consider uh, supporting me on Patreon. It's just patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. 
uh, in the last week, we actually got two new Patreon subscribers. I want to thank those two people. I don't know if maybe they're fans or not of the, the podcast, but that was pretty cool to see. Very grateful to those guys and all the other Patreon subscribers. Um, oh, I guess you can call them patrons, but uh, yeah, we offer some pretty good services there. If anybody has a lot of help that they need, a lot of questions, we do have a tier uh, that we offer a lot of assistance to people that have a lot of uh, questions that are just new at this kind of thing. So yeah, consider it. Thank you guys so much for watching this one. Uh, we'll see everybody soon. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Whatever it is that you want to do. Leave a review or something. Uh, we'll see everybody soon. All right. Take care, guys.